if the dynamic graphs were chop. Um, so two brief announcements. Uh, one brief announcement. Um, we will be hosting a open problem session at 4 p.m. after the last talk um, today. This will be like an informal talk where um, anyone can go up to the whiteboard and present their favorite open problems and hopefully like spark some collaboration among the, the, the workshop. So uh, I'm happy to present Lashman De La Pella from uh, University of Maryland and Google Research, and he'll be talking about parallel batch dynamic graph representations. Uh, Lakshman is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at University of Maryland. He obtained his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, where he was advised by Guy Blalock, and was then a postdoc at MIT with Julian Shun. His research revolves around designing high-performance parallel, dynamic, and streaming graph, proce graph processing algorithms and systems with a focus on both practical and theoretical efficiency. Thanks, Jason. Um, so, hey, everyone. So, uh, Jason said, my name is Lakshman. Um, I'm with DMD and Google Research. So today, I want to tell you about some of the work we've been doing on um, building practical graph representations. And it's kind of a, full, a continuation of the, the talk that Helen gave um, yesterday. So I, I hope this is going to be interactive. So if you have questions, we, we, anyway, I, I'd like to, love to hear your questions and talk instead of getting through all the slides. Um, we're all here for a workshop on dynamic graph algorithms. Hopefully, I don't need to convince you that graphs are interesting and useful to study. Um, they basically give us a way of representing connections and relationships between objects. One thing I want to say is a lot of the graphs we think about in practice are natural, so-called natural graphs. Maybe they come from friendships or you know, connections between roads. But there are also other kinds of graphs which are important in practice where the notion of you know, being connected is if the two objects are similar enough. And this might be from some machine learning model. For example, you might run a network, embed your points in space, and then connect two objects if they're within epsilon, distance epsilon of each other. And then semantic similarity can, it produces some sort of graph that you then want to process and cluster. You can solve a lot of important problems with graphs. Um, and some of the more practical ones that people, I think, care about at Google and other companies are, for example, clustering very large data sets, doing things like unsupervised learning using graphs, for example, produced by these notions of similarity, finding similar images or removing duplicates, um, using graphs to solve approximate nearest neighbor search in very high dimensions, and then doing things like spam, spam abuse, and fraud detection. So they have a lot of you know, real world impact, and people are making billions of dollars. Um, and you know, maybe if you go to industry, you can make billions of dollars. Um, if you have a good idea. So graphs are very big. Um, and one graph I'm going to focus on in the, throughout the talk and that, that I focus on in my work is this Web Data Commons hyperlink graph. This is a graph with 3.5 billion vertices and 128 billion directed edges. It's a hyperlink graph, which means the edges are drawn from web pages. And you know, a, a web page with a hyperlink to another web page creates a directed edge between them. And if you store these, this graph using a standard format like compressed sparse row, it's basically the adjacency list format where all the adjacency lists are stored back contiguously. Um, it requires about a terabyte of memory to store when you're storing both the in edges and the out edges for every vertex. And this is the largest publicly available graph that we have today, although people like Kuba are working on building bigger ones. So in a, sometime in the future, we might see even larger graphs. But I should say, you know, although this is the biggest publicly available graph we have, there are much larger ones that are available at companies. So people have graphs with trillions of edges already available to us. And this plot is kind of showing the rate of growth of graph data. So that y-axis is showing the number of vertices and edges in these graphs, and the x-axis is showing the year that the graph was collected. And you see this, this is in log scale, so you see this exponential growth and increase of graph size. So we need algorithms, all the things that we care about, sublinear algorithms, parallel algorithms. We basically need to, we can't get away with running sequential algorithms, um, and we should try to avoid looking at the whole input if we can afford to, although that's not really the focus of my talk. So the main point here, is that you need to use parallelism in order to actually process these graphs in a reasonable amount of time. If you ran a sequential algorithm, it would take hours to days, and there's no hope of actually getting your answer back in a reasonable amount of time. So there's been a lot of work motivated by this problem on graph systems. Okay? That graph, people cared about graph processing a lot in the 2010s, and there's been hundreds of papers that have been written, and this is just a, a small sample of them. I, you could probably go on for pages. And what, what kind of questions were people studying? What, what are the questions that we can ask? Well, we can ask, well, how is the graph represented? So the, the questions that we care about kind of span algorithms, representations, and programming language type of questions. So we can ask ourselves, well, how is the graph actually represented, and what format is it stored in, and whether, you know, what, what is the, the, the hardware that the, the graph is stored on? Is it stored in memory? Is it stored in external memory? 
And similarly, we can ask, well, how do users write programs to analyze these graphs? Is it something that requires um, a PhD in parallel computing to do, or is it something that we could ask an undergrad to do and they could actually write a correct program? There's, again, in terms of hardware, there's a question of whether the system uses multiple machines, for example, distributed memory, or it just uses a single shared memory machine with multiple cores inside of it. Um, I'm, I'm going to focus in this talk on the single machine setting, although there's interesting questions here as well. And finally, for, from the perspective of building these systems, if you implement an algorithm using the system and your algorithm admits good theoretical guarantees, is the system actually going to achieve or realize these bounds, or are there some reasons that the system might be inefficient? So I'm going to focus on this talk on shared memory graph processing systems. And I just want to quickly convince you that these systems are feasible. And just by renting some compute off the cloud, we can already process a graph at the scale of the Web Data Commons hyperlink graph. And again, that was a graph with about 4 billion vertices and you know, like 100 billion edges. Um, so we actually, when, when, during my PhD, we processed this graph on this server here. It's a server that Guy bought in, I think, 2014 or so for about the price of a Nissan Leaf. And in terms of depreciation, right, this is much more affordable now. If you buy this used, you could buy this for about $3,000, but a used leaf is much more expensive. So it's, you know, shared memory computing is becoming commoditized. And we should, this is something that we should just assume, and you should be designing algorithms for this setting that uses multiple cores and uses lots of memory. So again, remember, it takes about a terabyte of memory. And so you can just go to Amazon and rent a machine like this for about $10 an hour, or you could, you know, buy one off of eBay for about $3,000. And you could already fit that lar this largest publicly available graph in the main memory of your machine and still have plenty of room for algorithm-specific data. So I, I, in the first part of this talk, I want to tell you about some of our prior work on static graph processing and summarize what we know about static graph processing in, in, in terms of being able to process these graphs quickly. So during my PhD, we were motivated by looking at all that prior work on graph processing systems. And if you look at it and look at the problems they study, they study the same set of like five problems. They study breadth first search, page rank, between the centrality, some sort of shortest path algorithm, usually Bellman Ford, and maybe one other, which is basically some variant of BFS. And so the question we were asking ourselves, well, there's a whole, whole many other problems. We teach in our undergraduate algorithms class many other graph problems. And so how do you solve those problems in practice on very large graphs? Can you solve them or is it hard? And how complicated are the resulting algorithms? So this led to our work on the graph-based benchmark suite, or GBBS. Um, and this is a paper we published in 2018. And it's a graph processing system and benchmark suite that specifies input-output specifications for a collection of 20 problems. And this has since grown to a, a list of about 30 problems. And what we showed is that you can take very simple textbook algorithms from the literature on parallel algorithms. You look back in, from the 1980s, all the algorithms people developed for the PRAM, there's actually a lot of very practical ideas in those algorithms. And so if you carefully sift through the literature and just implement, carefully implement algorithms from the PRAM literature, you can get very fast and scalable algorithms that are practical and scale to the largest publicly available graphs. So our goal was to understand whether you can actually solve all these problems in a reasonable amount of time on that Web Data Commons hyperlink graph. And the code, by the way, is publicly available here. Um, and I also want to mention, so uh, I, in my work with Google, we're actually using this graph processing system um, as well as some other shared memory computing tools that came out of Guy's lab from this time. Uh, we use it for graph clustering primarily. So, yeah. Happy to talk after. So um, the focus of that work was, well, we want to actually understand if the theoretically efficient parallel algorithms are, are useful. So theoretical efficiency, we have to be working in some model. We worked in the work depth model. And you could think of this as kind of like the PRAM, where time translates to work. Um, sorry, the processor time product translates to work, and time is depth. So if you're familiar with PRAM, that's how you map. But the work depth model is much more intuitive. The work, you kind of think about your program as a computational DAG. And the work is just the number of nodes in your DAG. And the depth is the longest directed path in this DAG, or the critical path in the DAG. And using um, a scheduler, like a, a work stealing scheduler, you can schedule the stag, even if it's unfolding dynamically, in running time, um, the actual number of steps equal to the work of the DAG, the number of operations, divided by the number of processors, plus big O of the depth. We live in a world still where the number of processors is fairly low. So we need to worry about this. This is the term that dominates. So we care about designing algorithms that have low work. Um, and we don't really care about log factors in the depth, for example, or even polynomial factors, algorithms with n to the epsilon depth might be fine in practice. 
So our goal is to design and use work-efficient parallel algorithms, which have work that asymptotically matches that of the best sequential algorithm for the problem. And this is the gold standard. Ideally, we could design algorithms that are work-efficient and have polylogarithmic depth um, in NC. Are there any questions so far? So I said we are implementing theoretically efficient algorithms. These are the running, like the work and depth bounds of our algorithms. So I'm showing this for the 20 problems that we studied in, in the paper that we published. And what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that for most of the problems, the work is linear in the input size. There's a couple of problems that have um, an extra diameter factor in the work. And so those are only really going to be practical on graphs that have low or bounded diameter. But real world graphs mostly have logarithmic diameter. And some are slightly um, super linear, but not, not but only by log factors. And in most cases, the, the depth is also polylogarithmic, although again, in some cases, we're picking up a diameter factor in the depth. And again, I want to emphasize these, these are not algorithms that we came up with. We, the, the point of our work was just to, to validate that the theory that was developed in the 1980s in the PRM liter, literature is actually very practical. Um, and so what do I mean? How, how fast are these algorithms? Well, that on the Web Data Commons hyperlink graph that I, I showed you, we can solve all of these problems in under three minutes. So you, you have to basically load your graph in, mem in memory. And using a, a commodity multi-core machine, a machine with 72 cores and a terabyte of DRAM, you can solve all of these problems in under three minutes. So um, you, you should be thinking to yourself, like for most static problems, there should be a good parallel algorithm that basically achieves this kind of um, time. You, know, you, it, it's, it's, you don't have to wait hours to do this. You don't have to use any fancy systems. Just by using effic efficient shared memory algorithms, um, you should be able to get you know, running time on the order of a few minutes to solve these static problems. So how do we do this? Well, we, we build on prior work in graph processing systems. So we, in particular, we build a high-level graph processing interface in the lineage of LIGRA. And this is what Helen was also talking about. There's an edge map, vertex map interface that you can use to describe these graph algorithms. In addition to that, we have a data structure for bucketing, which is useful for expressing parallel set cover and certain other um, graph problems that need to basically store information about vertices in buckets. Um, the way this kind of works is we map operations on graphs and vertices down to a graph representation layer. And this is basically the representation layer is agnostic of how the underlying um, graph is stored. So there's you know, different types of representations. And you can implement your algorithm in terms of higher level primitives that don't really care how the graph is stored. And finally, um, these representations are mapped down to a, a library for efficient parallelism called par Parlelib. And Parlelib both can compile down to other parallel runtimes like Silk, OpenMP, or TDB, as well as use uh, a, 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 like an internal scheduler that's we, that we are calling the homegrown scheduler. And in terms of how you program these algorithms, they're done using very simple kind of primitives you would learn in a programming language just class. For example, things like mapping, reducing, filtering, uh, or packing and intersecting vertex sets, um, as well as some kind of whole graph operations. So the thing that's going to be relevant in the, in the second part of this talk is this compressed representations in GBBS. And here, we, what we are doing is basically taking the adjacency lists um, of the graph and compressing them by using delta encoding. So you can think about taking the neighbor list of a vertex and sorting that neighbor list. So you're sorting the neighbor IDs. And then you're, all you do is store the differences between consecutive IDs. And you could compress these differences, which are typically very small, using something called a byte code. And so typically, the number of bytes you need to represent a neighbor ID is about 1.7 bytes per edge on average. So instead of requiring about a terabyte of memory to store the graph, in the static format, you can store the graph in about three, between 300 to 400 gigabytes of memory. And so this is for the, symmetri this is the, the symmetri symmetrized version of the graph, and this is for the directed version of the graph. So just to um, complete this part of the graph, uh, the talk on static graph algorithms, um, we compared our static graph algorithms to some existing results on the same problems, but in the distributed setting. So the question is, well, how, how much better is it to use shared memory computing instead of what people were typically doing to solve these large graph problems, which is using either external memory or distributed memory systems? And so there was a, for, for this problem of computing the k-core of a graph, the k-core is the maximal connected subgraph where all vertices in the subgraph have degree at least k. And the way you compute this object is by doing some kind of peeling algorithm. Um, in the distributed setting, there was a prior result which solved this problem approximately. So they basically compute a two approximation for the coreness value of a vertex, the coreness value being 
the largest k core that that vertex is a part of. Um, they, do, they compute an approximate value because if you can actually peel the graph, you require a huge number of like distributed synchronization rounds. So that's why they're computing a two approximation. And it takes them about 350 seconds using about 8,000 processors, 16 terabytes of memory. And of course, they're getting an approximate result using very expensive uh, supercomputers, which none of us can afford. On the other hand, using our commodity shared memory multi-core, we can solve this problem exactly in about three minutes using 72 cores, a terabyte of main memory, and you know, get an exact result. So in pretty much every dimension, using shared memory computing um, is a strict improvement. So if your problems is, you know, if you can solve your problem in main memory, you should be doing this. Um, please. How much is that improved? So there's a more recent, so for, if you look at undirected connectivity, um, there's a more recent result from about two years ago where we're basically matching the running time of the distributed computing, uh, the distributed like supercomputer setup, but they're still using like 100 times more cores than us. But this result is not, this is from not new, right? It's from 2018, right? No, so he's asking how much have things improved since this um, point in time, but also. Comparison the columns, the yeah, right because it's 2018, right? So it's just two years difference. Oh, okay. Yeah, so th these numbers are also from um, the result in 2018. So I, I imagine if we ran this on, if we ran this on like the latest and greatest processors, this would be even faster. Right. Um, it sounds like you're kind of revising the PRAM algorithms from the 80s, but I was wondering like why didn't people use them before you revised them? Well, if you want to actually implement the PRAM, there's like a strict synchrony assumption in the PRAM. So you assume that your processor, processors are running in lockstep. And that was a, a pretty impractical assumption. It's very hard to actually realize that on a real hardware. Um, so the work, I mean, these parallel models are all sort of equivalent up to logarithmic factors in the depth. That's what Guy was saying in, in his talk yesterday. So the, the, I, I would say what, what we're doing is showing that the ideas from the 80s kind of transcend the PRAM model. Um, there are some ideas which are very specific. So when they started like working on getting like log star and depth algorithms, um, those are maybe not going to be portable. But some of the more like high level ideas about how to parallelize problems are portable. Yeah. Sorry, while we're on that kind of question. So a while back, everyone was talking about like uh, you know MapReduce, you know having a hundred thousand processors, you know which are not so which are not a multi core. So that is not not being used these days by Google, say. Well, I, we should talk afterwards. Um, yeah, please. So what Lakshman is talking about is about like graphs of hundreds of billions of edges, but we have graphs of tens of trillions of edges. So, so there is still- yeah, There's still scale. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there's definitely, I'm not saying that shared memory computing is this one size fits all. It's gonna solve all your problems for you. It's for a particular range. But I guess um, the, like what I would say is you think about the distribution of problem sizes. What the kind of problems we have, and maybe at academic labs, let's say you're a computational biologist, your problem almost surely will fit in shared memory machine. So it's not until you're like at the NIH and you're running on a database of like a million or you know 10 million genomes that you need to worry about distributed infrastructure. And maybe people are pulling the trigger and um, using distributed computing too quickly. Like you shouldn't be using MapReduce unless you really have a problem with that scale. Okay, so, so some summary from this, what we know about the static setting. We have efficient implementations of a wide range of basic and fundamental static problems. These are parallel <coughs> algorithms that can run on graphs with about 100 billion edges in a few minutes. And you can download these codes and try them on your graphs. And these graphs basically, th these implementations use compressed representations using difference encoding that and the representations actually have good guarantees. So if you implement a theoretically efficient algorithm, the, run, the, the system is actually going to realize those bounds. And you can store these real world graphs in very little space, right? About 1.5 bytes per edge. And so some questions still remain in the static setting. I'm not saying the problem is solved. Uh, one question I'm very interested in is, well, how do you actually scale to about a trillion edges cost effectively? Of course, we could just buy RAM and pack or you know, solve a problem in RAM, but this seems like a bad idea because now I depend spend like two hundred thousand dollars to buy enough RAM for a graph with a few trillion edges. So maybe it's time to revive the parallel external memory model and see what what kind of algorithms those are and how they perform in practice. Uh, and also, yeah, for people here, um, there are very interesting 
more difficult problems, for example, flows, matchings, solving exact and approximate distances when our graphs have larger diameter that become interesting in practice. Uh, thanks. For quick, uh, quick question. So I remember on the slide that you showed that your symmetric compression was smaller. Yep. Uh, is there is it easy to explain why? Because you're storing twice as many. No. So we're not storing the in edges anymore. The in edges are the out edges. Once you symmetrize, so the you graph... can't access from both the sides. I mean, you, if I want to be able to say I want all the neighbors in a symmetric graph. No, so in, once you've symmetrized the graph, you've basically taken all the edges and made them bidirectional. So you can yes. get, you don't need to worry about your out edges and in edges. They're just one set of edges. The, right, but the yeah. number of weights have doubled from... But yes, yeah, so when, you, when you symmetrize, you don't really double the number of edges. Actually, a lot of the edges are already bidirectional. So that's why the symmetric size was lower. But still, how does it make it lower? I can imagine it being comparable only epsilon more. Why was it significantly better? So because you're representing like more edges. In the, maybe maybe you can chat about this offline. Okay. Right? Yeah. But basically, the, a lot of the edges are already bidirectional, and so when you symmetrize, you're not actually doubling that number of edges. Um, but we, we should chat offline. So in the next part of this talk, I want to talk, tell you about some of the work we've been doing on dynamic graph representations. So of course, real world graphs are dynamic. And all of the static graph processing systems that we looked at, they really model the graph as static. And so there's very few systems that can actually model the graph as dynamic. And modeling it as actually dynamic matters for many kind of important applications. For example, maybe you're at a bank and you want to detect fraud in real time. Maybe fraud corresponds to cliques or cycles of some sort. Um, and there's other, a lot of other applications where actually getting real time guarantees um, and real time information about your data makes a huge difference, maybe for pandemic detection um, and other types of um, systems, right? Maybe for indexing and retrieving data, like in an ANN system. Um, so we need these kind of systems, but there's very limited work on graph processing systems that actually can support dynamic algorithms, and especially ones that admit good theoretical guarantees. So we're all here, and we all work on dynamic graph algorithms. So you should be wondering, well, isn't there a lot of work on dynamic graph algorithms? And yeah, there, there is. But I would say that the model, um, and you know, Guy has already kind of talked about batch dynamic algorithms, but uh, the, the model made sense back in the 80s when you know, the rate of change was kind of reasonable. So maybe updating your, our data structure one element at a time um, sort of made sense. But it, it becomes a poor fit, especially in the modern era, when you're getting millions of updates per second. So maybe millions of users simultaneously making calls, emails, et cetera. And of course, um, there's been some interesting work on actually parallelizing single updates. So taking a single update and showing that we can run that update in NC. So there's some interesting work on parallelizing, for example, Fredrickson's algorithm. Um, but the updates are still sort of happening one at a time, right? And you, you, in order to actually get more parallelism, you should be batching uh, in some way. And this might explain why you know, dynamic graph algorithms haven't really caught on in practice as much as they probably should have, because we're not taking advantage of the fact that you don't need like to know the answer after every single update, you, you, you typically only need like you know, 10 millisecond or a minute level latency. And so that means you can batch together updates and process them all at once. So we should really be considering, um, and I, I invite you to kind of consider this in your, in your work, the batch dynamic model, where we now allow batches of updates as well as batches of queries. And Guy said this already in his talk, so I won't really repeat myself, but the, the, at, a high, at the highest level, you get two advantages from batching. Batching gives you more parallelism. For example, I can take my data structure here, apply this entire batch of updates and get the new data structure, and then make a batch of queries in parallel on the new copy of the data structure, as well as it can potentially reduce the work that we pay per update because of some kind of sharing in the, um, in the update algorithm. So this is showing um, the fact that Guy mentioned yesterday Namely, that you know, if you're doing kind of k queries, you you have basically this entire top part of the tree that's shared, and they only pay individually for the bottom part, these like log n over k levels. So we have um, some prior work on batch dynamic algorithms that's been happening over the past couple of years. I think Julian and Quan Quan will talk about um, some of these works. Um, the main thing I want to say here is that the algorithms are work efficient. Okay, so if you basically take the sequential time and you multiply by k, that's exactly the work you get for a batch of k updates. But irrespective of what k is, you get polylogarithmic depth. So you get an algorithm, even in the case, for example, for dynamic connectivity, where the work is amortized log squared n per update, the worst case depth is log cubed n with high probability. 
the only work that's practical so far that we've actually implemented is um, our batch parallel Euler batch dynamic Euler tor trees. Um, and this work was also implemented. So we have a actually practical coreness estimation algorithm. Um, but the other two are not implemented. And I think implementing these algorithms and seeing if they're practical is a very uh, exciting direction. So I want to step back from talking about algorithms and look at representations. Because if you're doing batch dynamic algorithms, you probably need to represent your graph. So this is sort of the simplest thing that you should solve first to actually represent the graph in low space and get fast update times. And then probably the representation should inter interconnect nicely with the algorithm. And we'll talk about that at the end. So we have a graph. Um, we have objects in the graph. Maybe these are new stories. These are embeddings of new stories or something. And this, the setting I'm going to motivate today is the graph streaming setting. So we have simultaneously arriving um, and trying to access this graph an update stream which is adding new objects, new vertices and edges to the graph. So you have vertex insertions and deletions, as well as edge insertions and deletions and, and batches. And simultaneously, while the updates are arriving, you have a query stream, which is trying to run some analytics on the graph. And importantly, these queries should be running on a consistent view of the graph. So you want some guarantees on what, the, what kind of graph this query can see. So it's actually um, Guy motivated this and described uh, an approach for solving this problem in the fully concurrent setting. And yeah, the, the queries here are static algorithms. So looking at this model, we're going to call this the streaming graph processing model. And it's not really related to graph streaming like the way um, like Andrew McGregor and folks have studied, right? So this is a, a different model where we're basically streaming the updates. Like there's a stream of updates and queries that are arriving. And we want to process them in very low latency. So you want to basically run the queries on some consistent snapshot or view of the graph and produce some responses. And you also want to apply the updates to the graph with low latency. So for example, some um, you know, one um, solution that we should kind of consider and then disregard is, well, what if we just you know, run the queries and then block the updates while the queries are running. We just wait until the queries are done, and then we run the updates. That, um, you know, that will fail, because what if the queries are taking a very long time? Then the updates become very delayed, and new, new queries that start running while the long-running query is running will see a very stale copy of the graph. And similarly, we can't just run updates and block until the updates are done, because there might be a very large rate of updates. So we need to somehow run both the updates and the queries simultaneously. So that's the goal in the setting. We want to get low latency for both updates and queries that arrive concurrently to the system. Uh, is, is the setting clear to everybody? I'm assuming here that the um, updates are coming from like some source of truth. So there's a single writer that's basically publishing these updates. I'm not allowing, I'm not going to allow transactions to the system. But just to make sure, like a query, a quick query that comes in later, it's OK for it to answer a query about a, a more, a newer version of the graph. Than, than a query that was queued in earlier but took a very long time. Exactly, exactly. So we're going to basically um, serialize these queries at the moment they arrive in the system. They're going to grab a snapshot of the graph and then run on that snapshot. So the answers may not be serialized in the right order. Like in terms of the copies of the graph that they see, they might be out of order. So um, they, they, basically, the queries will get serialized at the time they arrive in the system and grab a snapshot of the graph. And that's the view that they're going to get. So basically, you'll run the queries in time order that they arrive. Are there any other questions? So um, also, just as a you know, as a hypothetical, there, there's some consider people have considered. Well, what if you just use a single version of the graph and run both the updates and queries concurrently and hope for the best? Um, I want to briefly convince you that this is going to cause problems. Let's say you're using, you're trying to detect triangles, and you're using triangles to identify fraud or something, um, then the query could be looking for a triangle, could basically search edges. And if your graph evolves in the following way, um, the query will detect a triangle even though a triangle never actually exists. So you observe this three cycle, but the three cycle never actually exists at any point in time. And if this is, you know, your, if, if your bank account gets locked for this, you're going to be pretty annoyed, right? So you don't want this. You, you want the algorithm to actually run on snapshots of the graph that exist, actually exist at some point in time. So the question we're looking at in our, in our work was, can we actually design a scalable and space efficient? And here, space efficiency is with respect to the best static representations of a graph. 
Um, and we want the representation to be batch dynamic, so it should support batches of updates and achieve low latency in this graph streaming model. So as a starting point for this data structure, let's consider um, a classic data structure, which is the purely functional balanced binary search tree. And we'll see that this data structure is achieves some of the properties, but fails to achieve space efficiency. Okay, so um, you should just be thinking about this as a red, black, and ABL, your favorite balanced binary tree structure. And the nice property about purely functional trees is that they enable efficient snapshots. So a snapshot in particular is just the root of one of these trees. Once, you're, once you have the root of the tree, because the, the tree is purely functional, it means that future updates are actually going to create new versions of the tree. So the old versions are never actually modified. And so these snapshots are immutable. So for example, if we're inserting the element 12 into this tree, we'll just create a copy of this path and then insert 12 where it should go. And even if we need to do rotations and things like this, there's only a constant number of rotations you need to do. Um, and so basically with log n, um, with a log n depth path copy, you can basically insert elements in. And this also generalizes nicely to handle batches of insertions and deletions. So for example, using the PAM library, um, you could you can get algorithms that have work k log n over k plus one and, and polylogarithmic depth. Um, how does this compare with like persistent data structures? So this is a this is a persistent data structure for a, a tree. It's a persistent tree. Thanks. I, I, I have to say we haven't looked at other like kind of persistent data structures. So I think Guy might have. Guy, did you have a question or? Well, compared to like what I spoke about yesterday, right? Yes. Yeah. That was making. And just compared to what I was, uh, spoke about yesterday, I, I didn't, wasn't doing a copy of the whole path. I was starting at the node that was being updated and just making a lo copy locally. And the two approaches have advantages and disadvantages. That's right. So we're not storing version lists on nodes, for example, like the work guy was talking about yesterday. So how do you represent a graph using a tree? Let's say we have this graph here, um, kind of echoing off what, what Helen talked about. Um, really, all we have are, if we have a set data structure, we can represent a graph, right? So we just use our trees as sets. And we can think about storing this graph as a nested tree of trees. So basically, there's a tree of vertices that's storing the vertices. Like, so that's this tr tree with blue nodes. And each vertex has associated with it as its value, for example, an, an edge tree, storing all of the edges incident to that vertex. So for example, vertex zero is edge tree. It's incident to one, three, and two. It'll have one, two, and three in its edge tree. And similarly for vertex three. Is this idea clear? We're just storing like a nested a tree of trees. So the, the black edges do not represent connectivity. No, this is just green trees. And the connectivity, so the edges, exactly. The connectivity is just in the edges represented in the green trees. The, every vertex is going to be connected in this tree. Right? So in some sense, the tree, trees are just some data structure storing the adjacency information. So this faithfully, losslessly stores our graph. And once we have our graph represented as purely functional nested trees in this manner, we get a graph representation that becomes safe for concurrency. So in particular, if we have a query that has serialized itself on a snapshot of the graph like this, if there's some update that comes later and modifies the graph, the modification, basically the query is immune to this modification. It doesn't see what happens in this modification. So the query becomes safe um, for concurrency. And we can, you know, even though this query is very long running, we can now start updating the graph even while the query is running, because we're just going to point back to old copies of the graph, and we don't actually modify them. So what are, yeah, Jason. Sorry, I just to go no, back to on. my comment on persistency. So like, you, you can view functional as also like as persistent as well. Like, are they the same, or is there like a difference between the two concepts? No, so I think purely functional data structures are persistent data structures, right? Okay. But there are other types of persistent data structures that use, for example, version lists. And there are other techniques for achieving persistent data structures that um, are different from path copying, like the Thanks. way I'm talking about it here. So if when you insert a single edge, you need to copy a path in the edge tree and a vertex tree, mm -hmm. what is the space usage of like a single edge insertion? Um, I guess it's 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 roughly it's it's gonna be like log n, right? Yeah, but because, do you have like I mean, but there are like constants. Do you have like uh, so that would affect this? Do you have like specific numbers? Um, no, I don't have specific numbers, but yeah, it's 
in practice, it'll be something like, um, you know, like 10, 10 to 15 path copies, like nodes that are copied, right? Actually, it's a good question. We should probably benchmark this. Um, it's something we should definitely do. D David, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so quick question about adaptivity here. So if, if this query comes in and you uh, use copy v0, and say, OK, based on this query, now I want to insert something, presumably you need to be working with a later version, v1, v2, what have you. Um, uh, how, how, do, how do you actually deal with this? In, Saying in like the, it's safe for concurrency. So, so sorry, based on, the, based on what the graph, the query is seeing, yeah. you're saying you're going to insert things into the graph data structure based on the query. Mm -hmm. um, then the query, that single query should be the only thing that's doing writes. If you have basically multiple queries generating writes, you need like a stronger kind of system where you have multiple like transactions. Yeah. We're not dealing with transactions, right? So maybe, it's, maybe the query is the only one doing writing, but then it's safe for concurrency, right? This is the single writer assumption. So some challenges of using just pure, purely functional trees, as I've described. One is that we get very poor cache usage. We're basically storing every edge in the tree in a separate tree node, and that's going to mean many, many different, like many cache misses when we're accessing, um, you know, for example, when we're mapping over all of the edges in the tree, because these edges, the, the edge nodes can be stored all over memory. And for similar reasons, we get very high space overheads. So, for example, in a, a tree, you typically have, you know, you have pointers for your two nodes, as well as some metadata that tells you. Um, some balancing information. So maybe it's the size or the height if you're using an AVL tree. Um, and so all of this starts adding up. So you need between 24 to 32 bytes per node in the tree. So the number of tree nodes becomes very costly. So for example, if you just took the web data commons graph and stored it using plain old trees, it requires about seven terabytes of memory. But we could do this statically using about 350 gigabytes of memory. And so this represents about a 20x overhead over just a static representation. And this is a pretty high price to pay for a dynamic representation. So the question is, can we obtain the same advantage, the advantages of purely functional trees while avoiding these disadvantages? And the main idea in the two works I'll, I'll quickly sketch here is the, the whole idea is to just put pack more data into a single node. So you, you kind of keep trees, but you're going to compress them by using arrays as much as possible. So it's kind of a hybrid data structure that's a, between a tree and an array. So you might wonder, well, wh why not just use a B tree? And the issue with B trees is although they can maybe help you uh, compress and use arrays, um, path copying becomes very costly because now you're, the nodes on the path that you're copying need to be of size about B, right? So our, our idea, uh, the first paper that we wrote on this was uh, a randomized data structure. And the idea is basically to pick a hash function and subsample elements to be heads with probability about 1 over B. And B is set to be about the size of a cache line. So if you do this, you, may, you maybe will get this set of elements, the yellow elements, to be the heads. And then you construct a tree where all of the elements following the head in the sorted order are associated with the head that occurs before them. So here, for example, 19 and 25 are going to be associated with this head. Um, this set of four elements are associated with this head. And this head has no elements associated with it. Additionally, you, you'll have a set of elements that don't have a head associated with them. And that's what we call a prefix. And so the overall representation is a pair of this prefix and this tree where the, the keys are the heads and the values are the arrays that are associated with the heads. Now, the nice property about this representation is that the, the, these arrays have size about a B, about B in expectation. So if you, size, if you basically set B to be about the size of a cache line, you're going to be storing arrays that have the size of about one or two cache lines. And furthermore, the number of um, heads that you expect if you're subsampling sub with probability 1 over b is n over b. So for a tree, you basically reduce the amount of metadata you need to store by a factor of b. So this is um, the main advantages for um, space reduction. And furthermore, we can further improve the space usage by taking these arrays, which are, difference in, which are sorted, and then difference encoding them. Any other question? So is this? Uh, is data structure clear? Okay. Why not just sizes of B and why use a random hash function? So we, later we do, we like get rid of the ran randomness. Um, so we, we can do that using a slightly different data structure where we basically take the leaves of the tree and then contract subtrees of size between B to 2B to a single yep. array. That's like the other data structure we have. And that, that also works. So we can we know how to do batch updates on this. Um, it's basically similar to some data structure, um, some algorithms that um, Tarjan and Brown designed in the 80s. Um, everything good happened in the 1980s, and we're just uh, 
yeah. reliving the work of our, uh, that happened in the 80s in some sense. Um, but we can kind of generalize those algorithms, these join-based algorithms to also solve unioning two of these, these tree data structures. So how do you handle like a batch insertion? You basically just build, you can think about it as building a tree on the batch and then calling union. And these bounds that you get run in pretty much the right time for comparison-based data structures. The dependence on B is wrong or too high in this first data structure, but we fix this in the later deterministic data structure. So overall, the, the, data, the, the framework that we design, it's a framework for graph streaming called Aspen, um, where we basically have a purely functional graph representation that's using these compressed purely functional trees. There's two, two versions of this that we have now. Um, and on top of that, you get a query interface for queries to run static graph algorithms, as well as an update interface for the single writer. So what's the space improvement that we get? So compared to this 20x overhead for plain old functional trees, we get a factor nine reduction in space. So we can store the web data comments hyperlink graph in about 700 gigabytes of memory. And this represents about a 2x overhead for dynamism in this graph streaming model where we actually get nice, um, you know, purely functional snapshots. How did this perform in practice? Well, I, I said that the, the main goal was to use, use this data structure in a, 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 multi, a single writer, multi-reader concurrence setting. So we, we conducted this streaming experiment where we wanted to understand what the overhead for running this data structure in the concurrent environment was. So the update stream here is basically obtained by sampling insertions and deletions from our graph. And simultaneously, we get a stream of parallel BFS queries on random vertices. So the, the whole experiment is very artificial. And this is par for the course for work in this area. And we should really try to get more realistic data sets. We should talk about that offline. So what, the question is, what's the impact of concurrent execution for us concurrently applying insertions and generating new versions of the graph on the query latency? And the answer is that there's no, there's no difference. There's like a 3% difference in latency. So you essentially can run about 80,000 updates per second on a single thread while you're concurrently running BFS queries with all the remaining threads in your system, and you see no difference in the latency. There's like a 3% impact. Second question is, well, compared to prior work on batch dynamic representations, we compared ourselves with Stinger, which is an older work, but there's actually newer ones that we should compare with. Um, and here we're drawing ed batch edge insertions from the RMAT, uh, from an RMAT generator. So we represent our graph using Aspen and Stinger, and uh, we're asking how does the throughput scale as a function of batch size? So we see at the lowest level, we're getting about 32x more updates per second, and up to 300x more updates per second. Now, if you remember Helen's talk yesterday, you know, you, we, you saw that basically we were comparable to Terrace. And so this, the throughput that we achieve is comparable to more recent kind of state-of-the-art in-place dynamic data structures like Terrace. But we're much better than um, the prior state-of-the-art at the time we published this paper. Um, I'm going to quickly skip over this part. I just want to say that what Sushant was suggesting, which is basically another deterministic approach for generating these compressed trees, goes through. You can basically take your tree and take a weight balanced tree and take the subtrees of that tree that have size between B and 2B and block them together into an array. And now every time you're doing updates, you kind of merge these leaves together. So you can kind of basically do one path copy with, and spend time log N over B, followed by like a single array operation on this block of size about B. And this also works. And in fact, the data structure is quite nice because it gives us a general purpose um, representation of compressed sets and maps. So we can, um, we're actually able to compress both the vertex tree as well as the edge trees. And this gives us about a 1.3 to 2.6x improvement in space over Aspen. So we, get, we, we can basically reduce this representation for the hyperlink graph down even, even a bit more by about 1.5x. Um, I'm going to wrap up now. So one question is, well, how, how does this all work with dynamic graph algorithms? Right. So let's say we want to implement the Holm, the Lichtenberg, Thorup algorithm. What do we need to store? Well, a very like kind of standard approach might be to store the edges in the data structure, the different levels, uh, the edges in per level in separate hash tables, right? And there's also going to be some Euler Tor tree per level. So basically, when the algorithm is doing the, the replacement edge search, it's going to map over a bunch of these edges and move them from one hash table to another. And if you think about what you probably have going on in your system, you probably have another copy of your graph just storing the edges somewhere else, right? So you, you have all these copies of the edges, 
And the overhead in terms of the bytes per edge that you're paying can be between 50 to 80 X, right? So 50 to 80 bytes per edge, which makes it so that you, you can't really run a dynamic connectivity algorithm on, a, on large real world graphs. So we have this um, kind of idea for how to integrate the storage for the HTT algorithm, which I think is a good uh, test, test case algorithm to actually implement efficiently. And you can, it turns out you can actually like inter integrate the level of storage into the, directly into the graph representation. So I can basically store my edges in a data structure like a C tree and think about basically placing barriers in, like think about basically sorting the edges in my graph or into into a vertex based on their level. And then when I'm scanning over edges in level three looking for a replacement edge, all I'm doing when I push them from level three to level four is changing where this barrier is. So this, you know, I, I need some extra data to store where these boundaries between levels are, but I can get away with basically the same storage for the graph and kind of pack all of these um, edges um, in, in different levels to be contiguous. And I, I, we should be able to use like the C-tree representation to do this. And this is some ongoing work that we're doing. The question really is how do you implement the HTT algorithm space efficiently? And I'm happy to talk about this um, offline. So I, I want to end, um, I'm already a little bit over, I want to end by it, it, for taking three minutes to tell you how to do work on bash dynamic graph algorithms in practice. Um, so for those of you who are doing more theory work, but you're interested in doing practical things, maybe this is useful. So the first um, suggestion is to pick problems people, and by people I mean practitioners care about. So picking problems that practitioners are already working on uh, makes it more likely that any sort of improvements you do in practice are going to matter to somebody. So when you build a library, maybe some computational biologists will actually use your work. Um, and it makes it more likely that real world data sets are going to exist, right? And this is more interesting and fun than benchmarking with synthetic data. And you could potentially just collaborate with people, right? In CompBio or um, phylogenetics. Like I'm working with some phylogenetics people recently and it's been a lot of fun. Um, the second suggestion is to use um, highly optimized parallel programming frameworks. And here I'm just advertising what we all use in our community. Uh, there's a, a wonderful library called ParleyLib, which came out of Guy Blalock's lab. And he and his students and many others have been contributing to this library and using it in their work. So you can get this on GitHub. And the code for the um, maximum contiguous subsequence sum is shown on the right here. And basically, a lot of the heavy lifting that you would do to write this algorithm yourself in some um, framework where you're programming the parallelism manually is abstracted away by very efficiently implemented primitives. So you can do things like parallel, like reduce. You can create sequences. You can create sequences that are not actually even materialized in memory. Um, so you can do a lot of beautiful things. And there's a lot of examples you can find on the ParleyLib website. So it's also a good tool for education. Um, and if you're teaching parallel algorithms courses, you should definitely check this out. This is an implementation of MapReduce. It's not MapReduce. This is a, a fork join parallel programming framework with a work stealing scheduler inside of it. So you, you can describe algorithms that basically do fork and then join later. So any sort of nested parallel algorithm maps to this framework. Okay, why, do, why should you use this? Well, if we all start using the same toolkit, we can, it makes it a lot easier to share our work and compare against each other's work. And we can start building an ecosystem where we actually all, you know, bench, it's easier to benchmark against each other's codes and start building opt, highly optimized dynamic codes. And I also want to say that the Parlay framework is being used at Google. And so this streamlines industrial evaluation and adoption of our algorithms. Um, you should also rent or buy a multi-core server. I just want to say, if you want to buy, it's really not that much money. So I bought a 96-core server with 1.5 terabytes of memory used for about $7,000. And I can afford that. Like I could buy that myself. I got reimbursed, but you could buy that yourself. Um, and okay, the pro of renting is that you can, for example, try Sapphire Rapids or some fancy hardware without purchasing it, which is very expensive to purchase. Uh, but the cost of renting can add up. If you do buy... Don't put it in your office because it's very loud. It sounds like an airplane, you know, you're like next to an airplane or something like that. This is in my office for a week and then it got moved to a server room. So don't put it in your office. And lastly, my, uh, my humble suggestion is please write implementations that actually run on real data sets. Like you should not be testing on graphs with a few thousands of edges or millions of edges. You should really try to build implementations that scale to billions of edges, billions of vertices and billions of edges. And the moment you take even basic questions that we think we understand well and try to scale them to a very large scale, new problems and interesting questions will pop up. Um, some ones that I, I'm interested in, well, how do you do dynamic trees that support path queries and actually implement them? 
um, some beautiful questions about like edge orientation that would be fun to solve. Um, and of course, how do you do practical bash dynamic connectivity? Um, and yeah, please evaluate on big graphs. So that's it. Thanks for your attention. I'm way over, so I can take questions offline. Thanks, Lashram, for the uh, amazing talk. Uh, we have a break after, so I guess we're not, we're not, uh, no, we have we're still not... some time for a few questions. Uh, so going back to the, <coughs> yeah, so going back to the static shared memory algorithms, you mentioned that the uh, number of processors is now small. <laughs> Um, so it's good to optimize work over processors plus depth. Um, and on the other hand, much of the work on parallel algorithms is on reducing depth. Um, what do you think is the right way of thinking about this um, as a theoretician and like if, if you only care about asymptotics? We cannot consider the number of processors to be constant, whereas it's just reducing, like optimizing the work, right? That, that's yeah. true, right. No, I mean, I'm not going to say that depth doesn't matter at all. Right? Um, and low depth algorithms are still like usually practical, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the, for example, like Mosin's paper on like DFS trees and like linear work, near linear work, and like root right. end depth or something, right? Like that, that's a cool result. And as a community, I think we should kind of be more accepting and interested in those kind of results. Um, because yeah, work efficient algorithms are typically more practical, and you still have good parallelism for that algorithm, right? The parallelism is polynomial. Um, yeah, so is it yeah, like fair ahead. to assume that basically the number of processors is some n to epsilon or? Yeah, so yeah, Guy, do, do you have a question? Or you just... Uh, yeah, just I guess a comment or question. Uh, yeah, on, on this topic, yeah. <laughs> should just make this a discussion. Yeah, I, I think what's more important to look at is the, the work over the depth, which is the parallelism. And like you say, you would probably want that to be like n to the epsilon, so n to the one half or something like that, but you don't. So if you have an algorithm that's n cubed work, you could, could even put up with n to the three halves uh, depth, and that would still give you plenty of parallelism. And so if you look at it more that you want the parallelism to be high rather than the depth to be low, then that might be a better way to look at it. So back to the practicality of the shared memory, uh, static shared memory algorithms at the beginning of the talk, you're saying there were two kind of key ingredients here. There was a compression scheme, and there's also these classic PRAM algorithms adapted to this uh, new representation. Is there any sense in just kind of figuring out which, which of these is doing most of the heavy lifting and the numerical uh, improvements? You could run everything we did without the compression, and it would still be fast. Like, mm -hmm. So for the very largest graphs, compression seems to make maybe like a 1.5 or 2x difference. But you're just pushing less data through memory and through your right, caches. Right. So that's what helps. Um, but yeah, so it's really not the compression. It's more like the parallel. Yes. The compression is what lets you do it with less memory, which we care about. So compression mostly saves on cache bases. Saves on cache bases, yeah. You, you had to still had to pay some CPU cycles to decompress, but. For very large graphs, the compression is a mixed picture. Also bandwidth, right? Exactly, for bandwidth reasons. Thanks, Ken. Thanks. We'll have a quick break, and we'll be back at 3.15.